Oh, good morning. Good morning, and welcome to our welcome to our worship. And again, a warm welcome to any who are who are visiting with us uh, who are visiting with us this morning. Visitors here today, I'm looking around to see Craig and Jennifer and the, the boys Sam and Martin again. I'm uh, looking round, looking round for Martin. Martin Lane, there you are. I had a horrible, a horrible moment. I thought you were watching the golf. <laughs> I know you were tempted, but didn't you? last week it was the tennis and the uh, cricket. This week it's this week it's the golf. So it's the golfers that are absent today. Uh, delighted to have you have you back. Yeah, I was actually going to invite Martin to preach again today, but for you that were here last week, you remember he waved that work permit about, which said expired <laughs> at twelve o'clock last Sunday. So that sort of kibosh that, but not to not, not to worry. Not to worry. It's been great having you, having you all here. So, uh, church, church notices. Um, warm welcome to Katie, Katie Yules. Katie is uh, going to accompany us in our hymns this morning, and that will be on piano. Katie will be playing this week and, and next. So thanks, thanks to her. You see the flowers on the Whitfield pulpit this morning, given in memory of James Maitland, loving father of Anne Spencer Ascot, Alison Hilton, and Jens, Jens Maitland. Um, and then the rest of the rest of the notices there. I would just say that in fact next Sunday, I won't be conducting worship because you and I will be away or visiting family, uh, and so it'll be the worship group next uh, Sunday morning. Please support them. Do not see this as an excuse to take a Sunday off. I say that because it happened for 30 years in Melrose, and I don't suppose this is much different. So please support the worship group because they put a lot of work into pre- into preparing and preparing the worship. Let us worship God, let us sing to his praise from 149. Let all creation dance in energies sublime. A hymn of God in creation, hymn 149. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he writes, Out of the treasure of his glory, God grant you inward strength and power through his spirit, that through faith Christ may dwell in your hearts in love. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thanks for the beauty of this new day, a new day in which we gather to offer you our worship and our praise. Joining with your church here on this island, your church throughout the world, its people of different nations, cultures, backgrounds, and histories, a rich and diverse church, 
worshipping in different ways and different styles. But at the heart of worship, the desire to acknowledge you and your gifts to us each day. We acknowledge you as the creator of all. The furthest spinning galaxies and wonders of creation. The beauty of this planet on which we live and indeed of this island. And creator too of our own lives. And we acknowledge you as a God who not only creates and then disappears from the scene, but a God who is constantly present, sustaining us, guiding us through your Holy Spirit. The Spirit which seeks to guide us in the ways of truth and of life, and away from falsehood, and all that denigrates or destroys life, and all that scars the beauty of life and of creation. For we confess when we look at this your world and indeed our own lives, there is much that would incur your displeasure. The violence and war and suffering that humans inflict one on another. The poverty and hunger which some will endure this day while others have far more than they need. The unfair division of what are your gifts to us. And so before you now, we ask forgiveness. Forgiveness for the ways in which we have failed in our calling. Calling to be disciples in Christ's name, to follow in his ways. To be people and agents of reconciliation, of sharing, of hospitality. People who listen for your words in their lives and in our own time. And as we ask your forgiveness for our failures, we ask too the forgiveness of those whom we have let down and failed by what we have done or failed to do. Grant us, we pray, the assurance of that forgiveness that in being freed from the faults and failings and the guilt of the past, this day may be a new day and a new beginning in which we seek better to live in your ways, to discern your presence amongst us, to hear more clearly what it is you ask of each one of us, to follow the very paths down which you call us, that in so doing, we grow closer to you and so closer to one another. And this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we have a few, few, few youngsters here, here today. I've got a photograph to show you. So if you'd like to come out and see, see this photograph. And then I'll have a wee story about what this is about. Do you recognize anyone there? Do you recognize any of these purple shirts that they're all wearing? Do you remember they were in church just a few Sundays ago? Right, these, all these ones in the purple shirts. Now some of these are our members. That's David Thompson. And there's our session clerk, Doug Frith. That's Doug's wife, Maria. And hiding at the back there is Judy Thompson. And there's Norma. So it's, and there's others who have all gone from Malawi, from here to Malawi, um, as part of the Bermuda Overseas Mission. Do you like their purple shirts? See, they're all where he's gone. They're, they're all wearing, their, they're all wearing their, their purple shirts. There they are, those that can... Right, there they are with some of their Malawian hosts. There you go. And they're, they're out there working with Habitat for Humanity, helping to build houses for some of the people that you see there in the front. Now, they arrived last Sunday after traveling for, I think it was over 48 hours, right? And they just set to it right away into the hotel Luxury accommodation, cold showers, that's if there was water. Right. Some of them have been a little bit unwell, but by and large they're doing... So, they've been there a week. Do you think they've managed to finish a house yet? Did you build a house in a week? No. What do you think? Do you think they've built a house in a week? No. They've built three. <laughs> right. So, if any of you are planning extensions or... Um, <laughs> Right, or building a new home or whatever, these are the people to get in touch with when they come back. 
It might not be to your design uh, or to your plan, but they're fairly simple houses, right? They're built with what they call cinder blocks. And apparently, they can only build the foundations and the walls. They're not allowed to put the roofs on. The local builders are doing, are doing that. But in one week, they've built three. And they've been to a hospital to visit the people there that we have links with. And all together, I think they're having a great time. Do they look happy? I think they do. And you know, despite these simple houses they're building, and they are very simple because of the, the people who are houses they will be are hardly have houses at all at the moment. So these are going to be nice houses for them, but they're very basic, they're very simple. They're not the kind of houses we live in, and that's why they can build them in, in three days. And they'll be building more this week. And I think they're getting such a warm welcome from the people there in Malawi. And one, just one aside, they've been, in, they've been in church earlier today. They've been in church in Malawi. And some of you, most of you will be aware that here in this church, we'll be running a, a, a recent stewardship campaign and a, and a pledge process. And Doug Frith, our session clerk, sent me a photograph this morning. And it's a photograph of a big board that has all the names of the church members and what they have given each month. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I get this impression, maybe not, maybe not. But yes, that's what they had. You know, 30,000, 30,000 one person gave, you know? Mind you, that was quatches, right? So that's about 40 pounds a month, right? 40 pounds a month. And some were giving 1,000 quatches, just over a pound, a pound a month. That gives you an idea of how little they have because they are generous people. So anyway, there's, there's the bomb volunteers in their purple shirts. I'm sure they'll have stories for you when they get back. They're doing it out of love, and we're going to sing now favourite children's one. Well, maybe a favourite with the grown-ups as well. 564, Jesus Loves Me. We'll stay standing for our blessing on the children. Loving God, as our children go from here, may they go always in their lives knowing your love. In Jesus' name, amen. You're off, Levi. You can go now. Hear the word of God proclaimed in the Old Testament. 
The first reading is from the book of Amos, chapter 8, from verses 1 to 12. You'll find it on page 856 of the Old Testament in the, of the Bible in the pew. This is what the Lord God showed me, a basket of summer fruit. He said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, says the Lord God. The dead bodies shall be many, cast out in every place. Be silent. Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring ruin to the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain in the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the ephah small and the shekel great and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account and everyone mourn who lives in it? And all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt. On that day, says the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on all loins and boldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only son, and the end of it like a bitter day. The time is surely coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. Today's Gospel is the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10, and at verse 38. It's a continuation of the, dis the, the journey of Jesus and his disciples as they make their way from Galilee to Jerusalem, and having passed through Samaria. Page 72 in your New Testaments. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. May God bless to us the reading of his holy word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. In 553, just as I am without one plea, O Lamb of God, I come. In 553.
May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable to you, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Just a few comments on the, the prophet Amos. Amos is one of the earlier prophets, known as one of the minor prophets. It's always good to recognize the context, the situation. Amos was from the south from Judah and yet the work, the prophesying he was doing was all connected with the north. And really since the time of the death of King Solomon these had returned to being virtually two separate nations, each each with their own king. So the first thing to realize is that this is a southerner telling the northerners just what's what and what is what is likely to be befalling them. And as such, not particularly welcome, this notion that a prophet from the south should, should come to the north, to, to Israel, to criticize them for their ways. And he makes it very clear that he's not part of what was called the prophetic guild. These were, if you like, the, the court prophets, part of the, part of the establishment, who would work hand in hand with the, with the establishment, indeed, with, with the king. He makes it very clear, I'm not one of your court prophets. He said, I am a farmer and the, and the son of a farmer. But he's there to offer them a warning. And in the passage we have, it was a strange vision. What do you see? And he says, I see a bowl of fruit. And then the message to him from God is, and this is about the, the end. And actually, it's, it's a play on words. The Hebrew word is case, case. And he would have pronounced it as that. But in the north, they pronounced it slightly differently. They pronounced it kes, kes. Now, a bowl of fruit is case, but kes means the end. So when he's saying, I see a bowl of fruit, God saying, I see, I see for the north, I see the end. And he does so because of the lack of justice and fairness in the northern society. Um, those who are wealthy are forever looking to find a way of exploiting the poor even more by cheating them through the use of faulty scales, Not can't wait to get the Sabbath over so they can get back to make more money. And all the time, it's the poor that are, that are being denied and not looked after. And they feel they're doing okay because they're, they're following all the correct rituals of, of religion and, and worshipping, but they are corrupt and they are not looking after the needy in their society. And so Amos is almost the first of the, of the prophets that takes up this theme. And you can see that others are influenced hugely by him, especially the great prophet Isaiah. And of course, Amos writes at a time in the 8th century BC, which just predates the invasion by Assyria and the complete destruction of the, of the northern kingdom. Although it's called the book of Amos, it wouldn't have been written by Amos himself because the style and the language differs hugely from one part of the book to the other. But the writers of it have picked up on his theme. And that theme, that powerful theme, is that what God wants, and it was to be repeated by other prophets, what God wants is not your rituals and not your shows of religion. He wants justice and fairness in the way that you deal with one another. How just and fair was Jesus, do you feel, in his treatment of Martha? What do you reckon? He arrives in this village and Martha, who is his sister Mary, offers him, he and his disciples offers hospitality. They come into, into her home. And while she is busy preparing the meal for them, which is a requirement of Middle Eastern hospitality, um, and, and was offered freely and graciously. As she's busying herself in the kitchen doing all this, her sister Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, doing, in Martha's terms, doing nothing to help. And so he, she comes out of the kitchen and says to Jesus, I'm laboring away here in the kitchen, making your, making your meal, and Mary's sitting there doing nothing. Tell her to come and give me a hand. She could at least come and peel some potatoes. And Jesus effectively says, leave her alone. You're apparently worried about insignificant things. Uh, she has chosen the better part. 
What, what do you make of that? Now, I know I've asked before in terms of, because this is often interpreted within the church as the Marthas of this world are those that are busy and active and doing things. Right? They're the organizers, they're the busy folk. And the Marys are those that are the quiet, contemplative ones, right? who just sit and think about things and contemplate, but aren't terribly active. And I've asked before, who's the Marthas and who's the Marys? But I'm going to ask again, where's the Marthas? Where's the Marthas in this congregation? Come on, who's the, who are the busy ones? Not just the, not just the women, the men as well. Come on, who are the busy ones? And where's the Marys? Where's the contemplative ones? Yes, Mike, we've got one contemplative in the whole <laughs> congregation. For those of you that identify with Martha, do you feel Jesus was just being a bit, being a bit hard on her? You know, leave Mary alone. Um, you're worrying about it would seem insignificant things. It's difficult to interpret the text. Is it that she's preparing a meal and he's saying, look, one, one, one's enough, you know, just one course is enough. You don't need to be too busy. Just something simple for us all to eat. You don't need to go over the top here. You're worrying, you're worrying too much. You know, is it, is it, is it about, you know, is it about that? And so just leave, leave Mary alone or, or is it something different? I think it's about something different. And I think it's essentially about Jesus again, as he did frequently, breaking down cultural barriers breaking down cultural barriers. When you look at Luke's account of the journey from the Galilee uh, down to Jerusalem, there's some very unusual aspects to it. Um, first of all, it seems that there are women traveling with them, right? It's not just the 12 disciples, it's women as well. They're mentioned, they're mentioned frequently. And they travel, and as they travel, they would stop at villages and be given hospitality and stay there for the night. That's most, most unusual. and would not be what was required and expected of the women who were in his company. They would be expected to stay with relatives you know, and, and not be part of, 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 of this group. And then in this story, we find, we find Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. Jesus was regarded as a, as a teacher, a rabbi. And there she is sitting at his feet as a as a student, that's unacceptable as well. That's for men. That's for men to be, to be students, to be sitting at the, at the rabbi's feet and learning. Uh, not, not for women, and yet there's Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. And to give you a, a, a sense of what it would be like for women in the society and the, at, of Jesus' time, it's interesting to look at some of the writings of a, an, aristocrat, an aristocrat called Ben Sirach S-I-R-A-C, whose, whose books are, 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 are available to us. And they're kind of strange because in the early part of the Old Testament, there, women, women are recognized and, and lauded. I mean, think of the story of Ruth. Think of the story of, of Esther. Women are, are given a, a reasonably prominent part and, and seen as part of, of God's agency, if you like. Not in the times of this aristocrat, Ben Sirach, he writes his followers. He's a, a scholar in Jerusalem. He lived and he wrote in the early second century BC, and he very much reflects the society that would have been of, of Jesus' time. The ladies don't need to listen to this if they don't want to. For Ben Sirach, women could be good wives and mothers and are to be respected. But if you don't like your wife, don't trust her. Be careful to keep records of the supplies you issue to her. Deed no property to her during your lifetime and do not let her support you. Women, these are all quotes from his writings. Women are responsible for sin coming into the world and their spite is unbearable. Daughters are a disaster. <laughs> Indeed, to Ben Sarek, a daughter was a total loss and a constant potential source of shame. There is no discussion of women apart from their relationship to men, and Ben Sirach's list of heroes of faith records only males. A low point is reached when he writes, do not sit down with the woman, for moth comes out of clothes and a woman's spite out of a woman. A man's spite is preferable to a woman's kindness, 
women give rise to shame and reproach. I guess he wouldn't be in any of the ladies' birthday card list after that. Eh? <laughs> but that, that gives you a sense of the, of the place of women in the society of Jesus' time. There was no doubt about it. This was a hugely patriarchal society in which women were, were really demeaned in many respects and given a very lowly place in society. And what do we find in the story? We find the woman, Mary, sitting like a disciple, like a student, at the feet of Jesus the rabbi. And in doing that, and in Jesus condoning it, not condoning it, but saying to Martha, look, Mary has chosen the better part at this point in time. He, he's, he's addressing some of the cultural issues of the day and, and emphasizing, if you like, the, the importance of women getting this place within his discipleship, of being students, of being allowed to learn and to listen to him, a teacher, a rabbi. When you read the story, and it does seem at times a bit hard on Martha, just remember the story that immediately precedes it. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. And it, it's Jesus stressing the importance of, of hospitality. He, he tells the story when he's asked the question, but, but who is my neighbor? And he tells that well, well-known story of the Good Samaritan who comes to the aid of a complete stranger um, and a Jew, remembering the conflict between Jews and Samaritans, who comes to the, the aid of this Jewish person who has been beaten up and robbed on the road to Jericho, where others passed him by. So there's no sense, there is no sense in which Jesus in any way diminishes the importance of hospitality and care, which is a real feature, a very real feature of the Middle East. It's just in this instance, he's using this example to again address a particular cultural boundary and to cross it and to do away with it. And he does away with it just in that picture, just in that picture of Mary sitting, listening, learning at his feet. We should be aware of the cultural boundaries in their own time and the need very often to see them challenged. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In 463, fairest Lord Jesus, ruler, ruler of all nature, in 463.
Let us offer now our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. Almighty God, for all your gifts and blessings upon us, we give you thanks. For your gifts to men and to women, to young and to old, to people of different nations and cultures and histories, each bringing their own insight, their own perspective to our common life together. For all these gifts, we give you thanks. And give thanks, too, for the vision of life as you would have it to be, seen by us in the priorities, the values of your kingdom, that kingdom in which divisions are overcome, barriers are broken down, the divisions that we create, the barriers that we build, our perceptions of one another, the cultural norms we cling to and which you challenge, all that detracts from what could be our common humanity with your gifts shared and life lived by all in all its fullness, your desire for us. And so we thank you for the prophets of old, for those who challenged the unfairness in their own society, the lack of justice, the lack of care for the needy, the confidence and the arrogance of the oppressor in their own religious observance while they cheated and robbed others. We thank you for the prophets and for their courage and conviction in your name speaking out against that which was wrong. And we pray that in our own day, we may face up to the wrong that we see and not be silent, but to speak out about the wrongs in our own lives, our own society, and in other parts of this, your world. And we thank you too for the saints of the church, men and women, who have sought to live in your ways and be faithful disciples. But above all, we give thanks for Christ and for his challenging the cultural norms of his own time, seeking to welcome into his fellowship those who were rejected and excluded, seeking to give women the same place as the men in their opportunity to be his disciples. In his name, we offer our prayers for others. We pray for our own families and friends, wherever they may be this day, whatever part of the world, and ask for your blessing upon them. May they in their lives know your love and your peace. We pray for others whom we know by name and especially those whom we know to be in need at this time. Our members who are in hospital, others who are ill, part of our very fellowship and community who are living at this time with a sense of loneliness, those who are anxious, fearful for the days ahead. And always in our prayers, we remember those who have been bereaved, whether in recent days, months, or even years, but who live with that sense of absence. As we bring, before you, bring them before you in our minds and in our prayers, we ask your blessing upon them. We pray this day for those who govern the nations, nations divided from one another, seeing each other as a source of enmity, the tensions that are now presently existing and the conflicts in different parts of our world. May the leaders of our nations be courageous in establishing what is indeed great, the greatness of your kingdom and its values. May the priorities be de-escalation of violence and tension and the building of new trust, but based on fairness and justice and a desire for peace. And we pray too, not just for the leaders of the nations, but all peoples of the nations, ourselves included, that we may play our part in being agents of reconciliation where there is presently conflict. 
whether in our personal lives, within our families, or within our society. We remember in our prayers this day those who have gone from Bermuda as part of the overseas mission and their work with Habitat. I give thanks not simply for all that they are doing, but for the welcome they have received and all that they will be learning. The young people experiencing Africa and Malawi for the first time and gaining a new and different perspective on life. We pray for your church, for the life of this congregation, for your church throughout the world, for a greater faithfulness to your ways, a greater trust in their calling, a greater obedience to that which is asked of them. And we remember those no longer with us, but whose love we were privileged to know and to receive. And pray that we may never think them far from us. For as we are in communion with you, so we are in communion with them. For this we give thanks, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our offering. Let us pray. Almighty God, in your name, we dedicate this, our offering, and all our offerings of time, of skills, talents, and money, praying that they may be symbols of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the signs and for the growth of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. In 465, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. In 465.
now go in peace. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and always. Amen.